to another Apollo Papyrus episode. I am Aaron Apollo Camp. For this episode, I interviewed an author who has written two fiction series, The Evan Wycliffe Mysteries and The Misadventures of Rollo Hemphill, as well as numerous standalone nonfiction books, the nonfiction book How to Lie with Charts, and the Substack newsletter Thinking Without Thinking. His name is Gerald Everett Jones, and here's my interview with Gerald. Gerald Everett Jones, welcome to Apollo Papyrus. Aaron, I'm pleased to be with you today. Feel free to introduce yourself to our listeners. I am in the, what one calls the middle years of life. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's so middle about it. Um, but I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not just out of college. Let's put it that way. I have been a professional writer most of my career, and I, for the first couple of decades, I wrote business and technical books, and I was actually involved in, I, I led the software team that developed uh, the predecessor to PowerPoint. This was back even before Harvard Graphics, so that was business graphics, and I wrote a book app about that called How to Lie with Charts. And that is still taught at places like Georgetown and Empire State. So blame me, you know, if anybody's doing that. Um, but then I turned to fiction. Oh, again, you know, in the last in the last few years, I've I've written fourteen novels, and among them is the Preacher Evan Wycliffe mystery series, which has won multiple awards, and. The fourth book in that series, which is Preacher Stalls the Second Coming, will be released on March the 5th. So that's a big day for us. And the fans have been waiting two years for, <laughs> for that sequel. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the, the other books, there's some romantic comedies and some of those won awards. There's some literary fiction. And I've got a blog on Substack, uh, thinking about thinking where I freely express myself from time to time. You've uh, written a couple of fiction series, and you mentioned one of them already, the Evan Wyc Wycliffe Mysteries, but you've also written The Misadventures of Rollo Hemphill. Without yes, spoiling well, too much of either series, what is each series of books about? Yeah, Rollo Hemphill Misadventures is a series of three romantic comedies. And those are what back in the day might have been called skirt chaser comedies. He's just basically a young man who's looking to hook up. And he's kind of clueless, and that's the engine of comedy. And those are pretty silly books, but um, they can be great fun, uh, provided that you understand that they was, these were written before me too. <laughs> so, um, but Preacher Evan Wycliffe, uh, those are mystery thrillers and the main character is a, he's a Baptist minister, but he's something of a doubter. I mean, he's not, he's a, he's a very much a flawed character. He's got a problem with alcohol. He, he, he is trying to kick an oxy habit for the pain, pain in his back. He has trouble hanging on to relationships, but he's, he's a pastor in this small farm town of central Missouri, just north of the Lake of the Ozarks. And the engine of these books, the drama of these books, is that people bring him problems that nobody else has any interest in solving. And the first book in the series is Preacher Finds a Corpse, and he's just come back to the farm community, kind of given up on divinity school and also given up. He actually did some study of astrophysics. He didn't get any answers there. He had trouble finding a job. He's a guest preacher. Also, bill collector for the local car dealership. And um, he finds his best friend shot to death in a cornfield, his childhood best friend. And he can't imagine that this guy would have done it to himself. And so the most of the book is trying to figure out how and why did this happen? And I would say that at the heart of not only mystery, but at the heart of not only human life, but religious, spiritual life, whatever, are these questions, why is there evil in the world and why do bad things happen to good people? And there aren't any answers here. There's plenty of questions. 
You've written a lot of standalone fiction works, which include Mick and Mariah and Brad, Harry Harambe's Kenyon Sundowner, Clifford Spiral, Bonfire of the Vanderbilts, and Chokehold, <laughs> and that's not a complete list. Without spoiling too much of your standalone fiction works, what are some of them about? Well, another word for standalone would be literary fiction because they just don't really have a genre. Um, Harry Harambe's Kenyon Sundowner, for example, is you might call it an adult romance. You might call it a melodrama, but it really is a fictionalization of some experiences that I had living in Kenya for two years. My wife was doing... Um, work in wildlife conservation and childhood welfare. And she was very much concerned with um, elephant conservation. And so we lived in Kenya. We actually lived there on the shores of the Indian Ocean in a resort town called Diani Beach. And we were very much involved in, you know, the people would come through town who they'd be going on safaris and You'd hear stories about poaching of wildlife and whatever, but that book is about a middle-aged fellow from Los Angeles who has been, his wife has passed away and he's, his life is pretty much a matter of, oh, golf and bridge. And, you know, he's just bored to death. And this Italian tour packager, this uh, tourist guy, uh, convinces him. He says, well, you know, if you just buy one of my packages, I'll make sure that you have a good time and we'll just go to East Africa and we'll do safaris and we'll we'll hit the bars and we'll do parties and I'll hook you up with, you know, all the girlfriends you want. And and he, he just thinks this is going to be a great time. He's kind of a couch potato. It's really not his thing, but he, this guy kind of talks him into it. Well, he gets over there and he finds, well, you know, he he does brush up against all this stuff. But basically, he finds that it's not for him. He kind of knew it wasn't for him. Parties and good times just not his thing. Um, but he does meet a, a middle-aged Kenyan woman in the supermarket, a, a woman who's been divorced and has got teenage children. And he kind of takes a liking to her, and they fall in with each other. And the the way that the book progresses is he has to decide, am I a tourist or am I a citizen? What am I willing to commit to? So it's something of a serious book. And uh, Clifford Spiral, an, another uh, literary fiction, is about uh, an older man who's had a stroke. And he's, he's in the, uh, the treatment home, and he's trying to piece together all the fragments of his life that he can remember. I mean, his mind has been disrupted very much by this stroke. And so it's something of a of a history of his life, but it's all in all bits and pieces. And it's it's fascinating for him, you'd say, or maybe troubling at times, and presumably engaging for the reader to try to figure out how all these puzzle, puzzle pieces come together. And naturally they involve his past loves and his his transgressions and his regrets and so that that's that's the engine of that book that's what that book is about so mick and myra and brad is a romantic comedy it's it's a it's a it's not a silly story it's it's a story of hollywood about uh, a woman who she's a a talented 30 something prosecutor she's actually an attorney and uh, she's not particularly happy in her job, but it turns out she studied opera in college. And somehow she meets this um, very prominent Hollywood agent and tour packager, uh, who, uh, I, uh, show packager, uh, wrong novel, show packager, who um, his star, who's something of a Beyonce type, uh, has dropped out of a stadium concert. You know, th this is a place where there's going to be tens of thousands of people that have paid hundreds of dollars a ticket to attend. And this is like at the last minute. And he needs somebody who's got the 
the bravery to kind of go on at the last minute. And, you know, they'll train, they'll train her for a month, but she doesn't really have very much time. But the idea is he's willing to, he doesn't want to ruin anybody's career <laughs> by shoving him up. And, you know, somebody who's really proven themselves. So uh, he's, he's perfectly willing to throw her into the meat grinder. Uh, but it, of course it turns out that, you know, she does pretty well. So, um, but then she's got a hedge fund boyfriend who uh, she probably has to dump if she wants to have a career in show business. So that love triangle between the agent and and her and the uh, and the billionaire boyfriend, um, and and as you probably know from the genre of romantic fiction, uh, billionaire boyfriend is kind of a subgenre of romance these days. But that's a fun book. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask you about another of your fiction works, Harry Harambe's uh, Kenyan Sundowner. Without spoiling too much of that book, what is it about? And was Harry Harambe's name inspired by the gorilla uh, that uh, had to be put down at the Cincinnati Zoo a number of years ago? Well, that's the book that I describe about uh, life in Kenya, life in the resort world of of kenya but to answer your question about harry harambi um harambi is not his last name harambi is the motto of kenya and it basically means we are okay. one and we it's 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 pretty much the same meaning as model of the not motto of the united states one from uh many e pluribus unum uh and he gets that nickname in Kenya because, you know, one of the things about being a well-to-do person in an environment like that is you kind of wonder, am I being played? Uh, you know, either you're a tourist and you're there to spend money <laughs> or you're a business person there to invest. And either way, it's, you know, it might be you know, you come into you you meet some fast talking guy, and it's like, oh yeah, uh, brother, your your money's in my money's in your pocket. You just don't realize it, uh, and and so then Harry has to begin to understand. All right, if if I'm be, if I'm being played, do I mind? <laughs> you know, nobody ever paid attention to me before. Now, as far as I didn't know the story of the gorilla at the zoo. Um, one of the things that I know about, uh, and and of course, Harambi is very much um, a daily word that you will hear in Kenya because it came to be synonymous not only with the motto of the country, but of of politicians who had their hands out. So a, a, a Harambi is a, like a political favor or a, or a even corrupt political contribution. So Harambi's got kind of a double meaning these days. But um, the, the original meaning of Harambi was really quite joyful. So it's entirely possible this gorilla would have been named uh, after that tradition. Uh, I will say from the standpoint of animal conservation and wildlife preservation, they're part of the uh, animal rights movement in this country is really to get away from zoos and circuses that, you know, the, um, it's just, it's not, it's not our place to be locking up, uh, you know, our, our sentient creatures who really need to be out. I mean, an elephant really will, can walk a hundred to 200 miles a day. I mean, you don't want to stick them inside a cage. And they won't be healthy if if you do. I mean, in India, for example, the Indians, um, the, the the elephants that are uh, there in India, there aren't as many uh, wild elephants in India these days because they were pretty much all hunted down. Uh, but uh, the ones that uh, survive today, many of them are associated with temples because you know they're a religious icon, if you were even considered gods in some ways but the problem is that the one of the problems is that an elephant that is associated with a temple is actually chained to a spot it's changed chained there where people can come and pet its head and ask for a blessing and if an elephant is chained in a place 
and is just simply simply stomping up and down all day long, which is what they do and they become frustrated and nervous, their ankles will deteriorate and they will become ill and they will have a premature death. So it's it's incredibly cruel to to chain up, well, really any animal, but uh, elephants in particular, because if they don't, if they're if they're not allowed to roam, which is what they do, um, they will have health problems. I want to pivot to your nonfiction book, and you mentioned this in your intro. Uh, one of your nonfiction books is How to Lie with Charts. Without spoiling too much of that book. What is it about, and how many editions of it have been published? <laughs> it, the le most recent one is the fourth edition. It's been around for a while. It's actually, uh, as I say, it, it it was on the syllabus at Georgetown. I don't uh, Georgetown Public Policy Institute. I don't know if it still is. I know it's still being taught at Empire State because I had a uh, a query from them the other day. Uh, the premise of the book is that if, for example, you're using PowerPoint or Excel to generate a chart, uh, the software makes some assumptions that might not necessarily present the data in the most truthful way. Uh, and it's simply a matter of being aware of how the composition, the data design behind a chart affects the way that people perceive it. And uh, one really basic example is it's it's really a problem to present any pie chart as a as three D, because the the wet the pie wedge that's in front, because of the thickness of the three D, it's going to make that wedge look bigger than the others, and it's not. It might might not be, so it's it's causing an error in perception. It makes it it just it distorts the data, because you go oh that's really important. Well it's there, it's imp it might be important to the speaker. They might be telling you a fib that their sales results for that segment is bigger than anything else. One of the things I did with that book in the fourth edition was I had two new two new chapters, which you might consider to be very re relevant today. One of them is called abuse and use and abuse of metadata, and so you know all this data that's being collected on in, in various uh, uh, iPhone apps and and uh, in in surveys and internet aggregation and you know even by your telephone calls people have a great deal of paranoia about metadata and how how could that be used or misused and if if it's used in the appropriate way metadata it doesn't have any identification of individuals it doesn't know your name it doesn't know your address it simply knows you by a category you know, like, a, uh, you know, me, middle-aged white person. Okay, fine. Uh, and I live in, I, li I live in a certain area code and that area code has got certain demographics. So, you know, the political pollsters will care about that. Well, a political poll is an example of metadata. Another example of metadata is if you walk into the doctor's office and they are on an electronic health record system, EHR, which is, was actually, um, mandated by the federal government during the uh, Obama administration. Not only can they see uh, what is recommended for um, the um, the symptoms that you might present, but they also can see statistically what drugs have been affected effective against it, and also from the chance standpoint of the insurance company, which ones have been most cost effective. So that's that's really quite a benefit. I mean, and that's really the basis upon which artificial intelligence will build recommendations about what to do, and those need human interpretation, but that is that's very valuable information. The other chapter that I added to that book, uh, is 11 ways to spot fake news. <laughs> so, and, and granted, this is not necessarily graphic, but I felt it had to be in there. And a good example of that is, you know, if you've got two politicians on a debate stage, if one of them knows he's going to be accused of something, he'll accuse the accuser first. <laughs> and so it's it's like, well, you also did that. <laughs> Or you and and it it but what it does 
from a standpoint of distorting the data is if you accuse the accuser, you reverse cause and effect. In other words, if I'm the victim of, uh, well, if I'm the perpetrator of a crime, if I'm if I'm the guilty party, you know, if I hit you, if I say, oh, well, he insulted me first, <laughs> you know, that, that might or might not have been true, but you're accusing the accuser. So you're reversing cause and effect, and it makes it makes the perpetrator look like he's the victim of events, and it, it might make them seem less guilty. And so we see that all the time. It's done in social media all the time. And um, there's all kinds of other ways to distort, all kinds of other ways to to um, not necessarily hide the truth, because you can't hide the truth anymore. But you, what you can is you do is you can develop 20 different versions of the truth because you know how they used to ridicule the expression alternative facts you know oxymoron you know the, there are no such things as alternative facts or just facts well there are alternative sets of facts so if you leave out certain facts and, and only present others then again you're distorting the situation now it could be if you're a an investigator whether science, be it scientific or criminology or whatever, if you're an investigator and there are certain facts that you need to know that you don't know, then of, of course your explanation is not going to include those facts until you've uncovered them. So by definition, your theory or your theory of the case is an alternative set of facts. And that can't be taken as truth if we say we haven't uncovered all the facts that it would take to convince us beyond a reasonable doubt or in a civil suit you know beyond you know um the propon what they would call the preponder preponderance of, of evidence so so yes those are the those are the two new chapters how to lie with charts and it has a lot to do with not so much teaching people how to lie but um making them aware of mistakes that they might be making in the chart in the graphics that they're creating or that their software is creating, but also um, mistakes, whether they're intentional or otherwise, that they might see in other people's presentations. You know, if you see a sales presentation on life insurance, there could be some graphs in there, you know, about you should be hitting, you know, should be investing this much by, by, by age 64 whatever, if you want to have this amount of money, you know, by the time you retire, um, it's going to take some some smarts and some chops to uh, to see if there's distortion in those graphs. You could be, you know, you could be being, being led, I wouldn't say led astray, but you could be being convinced to uh, invest in something that might not be in your best interest if you don't know what you're looking at. What drives you to write in a lot of different genres? I have trouble controlling the things that pop into my head, Aaron. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do try to amuse myself and entertain myself um, because I feel that way. Not only it keeps me out of trouble, but I think it does, but also it might entertain my, my readership. But one of the things I've discovered is when I wrote business books, I wrote those for major publishers and I always had to submit an outline and sample chapters before I started the book. And I had to stick to that outline. If I didn't, then my the editor they'd assign me would you know slap my wrists. So, but when I started writing fiction, in the beginning, I adapted some unsold screenplays of mine, and, and that became a structure. So you could say I was following an outline. But as I got especially into writing mysteries, I began to realize that if I started from a blank page without a huge expectation about where it was going to go, not only could I surprise myself along the way, but I could develop some twists and turns that would be just plain unexpected and might be therefore engaging and entertaining you know i because i i didn't know, i was wondering what would happen next you know <laughs> i want the reader and i've had beta readers i have, I have some colleagues who read my books before they're published 
and you know catch me up on big errors hopefully but uh you know some of them say you know i really li i did not know what was happening until the last page and you know i said well i'll confess i didn't know either <laughs> Are all your books self-published, traditionally published, published by a hybrid press, or did you use a mix of different publishing methods to get your books published? All, all of the above. Uh, when I wrote the business and technical books, I had um, an agent, and I wrote exclusively for mainstream book publishers. Most of them in the technical area would be Peach Pit, Cybex, John Wiley, the, those those publishers. And then when I informed my agent that I wanted to concentrate on fiction, I'd, I'd done some fiction before that, and I I, I studied screenwriting. I, I, you know, had, like most people here on the left coast, I had a closet full of, you know, plays that had circulated around town. But uh, when I told my agent that I was going to write fiction, he said, well, have a nice life, kid. And that <laughs> that got me into uh, self publishing. I was one of the early uh, adopters in print on demand, and actually, it was the second edition of How to Lie with Charts before um, it went on to uh, the subsequent edition. The second edition was actually a uh, print on demand edition of that book. Uh, but since that time, I've developed my own small imprint, and I've learned to operate as a um, as a small press, which is, I have still published primarily my own books. I did uh, publish a book of my my father's. Uh, so we've got, oh, I don't know, 20 plus titles in the La Puerta Books and Media uh, imprint. But I have learned how to behave like a publisher. So um, it's not strictly self-publishing. But I will also say uh, I do work um to keep myself in groceries. I do work as a developmental editor and a, and a consultant to other authors. And I do typically recommend self-publishing for them if they're doing fiction, because m my experience in fiction is you will need to query, and it's usually by email, you will need to query about a hundred book agents to get two or three of them to want to look at your work. And of those two or three, it's still a pretty long shot whether you're going to get picked up. Even and if you even if you get picked up, it could easily be a year or two before that publisher decides, and they it's the publisher that will decide before that publisher decides that that book is ready to go on the shelf someplace. So that's the big disadvantage, especially if you're starting out especially if if you haven't uh, pub published uh, you know a book length fiction before um when you're starting out if you if you were so fortunate to acquire um a, a publishing deal then it's it's you're not going to be published as soon as you would be you're not going to hit the market as soon as you would be and one of the things that i think is very important to understand is in in today's publishing marketplace a publisher is going to expect you to do as much work as you would do publishing yourself in terms of promoting the book. You're going to have to have a website, a blog, a podcast, or you know, various ways of building an audience. And indeed, even getting a publishing deal, those writers who have something of an audience built already by whatever means, um, even if it's just a series of blog posts or a, a podcast with a following, that kind of thing, that will be an advantage. That will be an edge to actually getting a publishing deal. We only have several minutes left in this uh, interview, but uh, you write the Substack newsletter, Thinking About Thinking. What topics do you write about in your Substack newsletter? I do concentrate primarily in thinking about thinking on topics not on not on cert, not on my books i mean often i'll put an ad or a promotion for one of my books at the end of a blog post but what i typically do is i will be talking about topics like near-death experience like 
paranormal experiences, like spirituality, like um, why do bad things happen to good people? I mean, those kinds of things that I turn over in my head, those will be the topics of the blog posts. Typically, I will be taking a book, not, not a book by a, a new author, and not necessarily a new release by an established author, but I will take a book. It may even be from my own bookshelf, and I might have read it years ago, but it will be it'll be something that relates to the topic that I'm talking about with the idea of here's a thought starter. Here's somebody else who talked about this. And so it's really all about engaging the imagination. And I find that to be great fun. Gerald. Thank you for appearing on Apollo Papyrus. You are a wonderful guest. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for the opportunity. As a data visualization nerd, I hope to be able to read How to Lie with Charts soon. This is Aaron Apollo Camp reminding y'all to write and read your passion. Bye for now. Remember to subscribe to the Apollo Papyrus YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash at Apollo Papyrus and the Apollo Papyrus Substack newsletter at apollopapyrus.substack.com. Y'all can visit the Apollo Papyrus website at camparinapollo.witsite.com forward slash Apollo Papyrus and follow Apollo Papyrus on threads, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at Apollo Papyrus. Copy Copyright 2024, Aaron Apollo Camp, all rights reserved. This podcast episode is intended for the private listening of our audience. Any reuse or retransmission of this episode without the express written consent of the podcast host is prohibited, except under fair use guidelines. Royalty-free music and sound effects obtained from https colon forward slash forward slash www.zapslat.com.